when we refuse to admit the interchangeable character of ideas, blood flows. Firm resolves draw the dagger, fiery eyes presage slaughter. No wavering mind infected with Hamletism was ever pernicious. The principle of evil lies in the will's tension, in the incapacity for quietism, in that Promethean megalomania of a race that bursts with ideals, that explodes with its convictions, and that, in return for having forsaken doubt and sloth, vices nobler than all its virtues, has taken the path to perdition, into history, that indecent alloy of banality and apocalypse. Here, certitudes abound, Suppress them, best of all, suppress their consequences, and you recover paradise. What is the fall but the pursuit of a truth and the assurance that you have found it? The passion for a dogma, domicile within a dogma. The result is fanaticism, fundamental defect which gives man the craving for effectiveness, for prophecy, for terror. A lyrical leprosy by which he contaminates souls, subdues them, crushes, or exalts them. Emile Turan, former fascist. This video is going to be an attempt for me to explain fascism, to understand fascism. I am going to make a prepared statement, and then uh, afterwards I'm going to give you a more extemporaneous ramble about my thoughts and uh, th pertinent facts related to the topic. But first I want to read you my prepared statement. I am a nihilist. I believe in nothing. I have as much contempt for the fairy tale nostalgia and empty, watery ideals of fascism as for the deluded revolutionary fancies and violent liberality of communism. Most videos you'll see about fascism which seek to deconstruct it and make its principles applicable to our modern world are made from a very left-wing perspective. They are turgid, by-the-book, party-line, liberal, Marxist, or anarchist analyses. They approach the study of fascism the way General Patton approached Irvin Rommel, as a tactician following the wisdom of Sun Tzu, that old what is fascism and how to fight it. As if your audience has already decided to fight something that it doesn't yet understand. Of course, I jest. I don't mean to ascribe too much meaning to a title. As we all know, the cover is not the book. What these bright young essayists fail to realize, though, is that fascism is not the true enemy. The true enemy is something far more insidious. The true enemy doesn't strut around advertising his evil to the whole world in as blatant a display as these. He works in subtler ways. I began my study of fascism long before I recognized the true enemy. Perhaps I recognized him on some level, but I hadn't really understood him. I didn't know him. Back then, I was studying communism, and in my exploration of the communist ideology, I, of course, encountered that stale, crusty, weak old loaf of bread tube that all the kids were raving about for some reason. What I noticed is that bread tubers and other communists like to style themselves as revolutionaries, as class warriors. And if you're going to be a warrior, you need an enemy. Capitalism is the obvious enemy, of course, but capitalism isn't quite exciting enough. The struggle between capitalism and socialism isn't quite marketable enough to make heads turn. 
A capitalism isn't quite scary enough to be dragon to socialism's knight in shining armor, the Darth Vader of bread. A capitalism is a boring dystopia. On the left, there is no political ideology that is more hated and less understood than fascism. Well, perhaps liberalism. But liberalism is only hated insofar as it can be compared to fascism. Fascism is the gold standard of evil. It is ironic that fascism is always criticized for being the politics of fear by the very same people who exploit it to promote their own politics of fear. The spooky, scary specter of 1933 is coming for you and your children. Look, there he is over there. And over there. And over there. And over there. Just saying the word fascism is enough to send a chill down the spine of a communist. Fascism. Ooh, I'm beginning to feel it myself. Did a draft come in, or is that fascism turning on the air conditioning? You know, Anton LaVey once said that Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. So maybe we should take another look at Satan. Maybe we should look at Satan not from the perspective of the Archangel Michael donning the armor of God to do battle with the demons at the gates of heaven, but rather from the perspective of a void, the annihilation of all Satan's gods and prophets all doctrine fixers and belief mongers alike. A truly fresh perspective on fascism that's not trying to abuse and exploit this political ideology for its own gain. My study of communism led directly to my study of fascism because it came clear to me that communism and fascism are the Oak King and the Holly King. Every year they do battle in the streets of their own dystopia, each believing the other to be the one in charge, the one who is subverting truth and justice, the one who is extinguishing our precious sacred flame of civilization, the one who is ravaging and violating the human spirit. These two immortal foes will continue to do battle against each other, and I'll tell you what, I am not going to be the one to get my nose bloodied in that battle. I can predict mockery coming my way, that trite old condemnation of le centriste rationnel. Ho ho ho. Well, I'll settle your idiotic assumptions before they emerge. I am a communist. Alright? Just to be clear, I agree with the principles of socialism, generally speaking. Now I know what you're thinking, hold on. You just said you were a nihilist at the beginning of this video and that you believe in nothing. How can you believe in communism if you also believe in nothing? The truth is that I believe in socialism with as much conviction as a gambler believing he is going to win big at the roulette table if he bets all his chips on red instead of black. That is to say, I don't believe in it, but if I were to believe in anything, it would be socialism. For this reason, I don't care whether socialism is true or false. I have no attachment to political ideology or ideology of any kind. I don't even have a special attachment to nihilism. I am simply a renunciation. I'm not here to be your watery-eyed simp. I'm not here to convince you of anything either except perhaps of your own ignorance. What drew me into the study of fascism was the way it was represented on the left and the loose manner in which the term was thrown about to describe basically anything and anyone that they didn't like. If you listen to the online left, you'll pretty much end up believing that fascism is a synonym for conservatism. Because anyone, anytime anyone says anything conservative, the online left labels them a fascist, and every conservative talking point is labeled a fascist talking point. This is obviously an unsatisfactory conclusion, not because it makes conservatism look bad, but because it waters down the distinctiveness of fascism and just reduces it to nothing.
Because fascism is clearly something different from garden variety conservatism or garden variety racism for that matter. Another common thing I see is certain people using the term fascist as virtually synonymous with racist, or using proof that a person is racist as proof that they are a fascist. And this again I have problems with. It assumes that all racists are fascists, or that all fascists are racists, and truly neither of these assumptions is valid, although it might seem like they are. Outside of the circle of autistic internet warriors, the term fascist is often used as a general term of insult directed at people behaving in an authoritarian manner. And that is because the main thing that fascism is associated with above anything else is authoritarianism. That seems to be the one thing that everybody can agree on. Fascism is authoritarian. Well done, boys. We've cracked it. But I think that's the first and the last thing that everybody can agree with about fascism. There are wildly different opinions about what fascism even is and what defines it. Conservatives likes to highlight the more left-wing aspects of fascism, its similarity to communism, and its authoritarian aspects. Left-wing people like to highlight the cultural similarities of fascism and conservatism, how they are both reactionary, and how conservatism is also authoritarian. Basically, defining fascism is never about fascism. It's always about red versus blue. Fascism is such a boogeyman, it's such a pejorative, it's such a term of insult, that the goal of defining it is never actually about understanding it sympathetically, considering it, engaging with it honestly as one idea among many others. It's always about using it to attack someone else, and deflecting accusations of your own commonality with it in the process. And yes, I used the word sympathetically. Because I'm not so stingy with sympathy as to dole it out so arbitrarily as you. But hold on, you protest. Fascism has killed millions of people. Well, so have a lot of things. Capitalism has killed millions of people. Communism has killed millions of people. Religion has killed millions of people. But you know what has really killed the most people? Stupidity. And I think it encourages stupidity when we tell ourselves that we don't have to think. We don't have to consider foreign ideas with any sympathy. That we have the right to fortify our beliefs. Because the true enemy that I alluded to earlier is belief. That is what Emil Choran recognized back in the 1940s. And that is what I only recognized a few months ago. In trying to understand fascism, I must rescue fascism from belief. And that is what I'm going to try to do in this video. So there you go. That's my prepared statement. I hope you liked it. But uh, that's not what the bulk of this video is going to be. I was just there explaining my perspective, um, what I'm bringing to this conversation. Um, what I really want to talk about is how to understand fascism. What fascism is, who the fascists were, and what really characterizes fascism as a distinct political movement and as distinct from conservatism. I suppose first it would make sense to actually try to figure out who we're even talking about. Now, there are there were a lot of far-right uh, sort of populist uh, fascistic movements that emerged in Europe uh, during the interwar period, um, but not all of them called themselves fascists. They usually had a different name for what they did. Of course, the Germans called themselves National Socialists, which was abbreviated to Nazi, and uh, they did not call themselves fascists. The Italians were the first ones to use the word fascist, and fa fascist is a word that comes very firmly out of Italian history. 
you know, back in ancient Rome, they had this symbol that symbolized authority that was a bundle of rods tied together with an axe head in it. And under fascism, that symbol, the fasces, uh, was used as their, um, uh, their sort of symbol to represent unity and power and power through unity. And in Italian history in the 19th, in the 19th century, they had these uh, political groups called fasci, which were these sort of uh, loose bands of people who uh, got together for a, a specific purpose. Uh, usually a sort of uh, reformist kind of not insurrectionary but uh, direct action approach and so this term was then used by uh, Mussolini he called his group the fasci di combattimento which means uh, the uh, the fasci of combat and then the one other uh, notable example that I know of of uh, a group using the term fascist to describe themselves were the British Union of Fascists, which was the mainstream fascist movement in Great Britain, uh, led by the uh, member of parliament or former member of parliament, Oswald Mosley. And so when trying to understand fascism generally, uh, I tend to stick to these examples of people who actually used the label of fascist. Although I definitely would apply the term to other similar groups in Europe as well. Now, uh, before I begin really exploring this topic, I just want to talk a bit about what I know because my knowledge of fascism is not far-reaching, it's not uh, expansive. I studied a few areas pretty closely, and it, that, this was a few years ago, so my my memory of it might all be a little bit fuzzy, but I've tried to kind of refamiliarize myself. I went back and read a bunch of my old notes for this video. Um, what I studied was I studied uh, the pre-regime history of Italy and the history of the fascist and how uh, they got together and formed their movement originally. I read Mussolini's autobiography. I also read essays by Italian fascists about fascism. Um, and then I read, I read um, Oswald Mosley's autobiography and a little bit, I didn't get very far in it, but of uh, Nicholas Mosley's uh, biography of his father. And I also, uh, I read, I think I read a couple essays by Mosley as well. I didn't get around to reading The Greater Britain or any of his books. Uh, I would like to read those someday. Uh, and um, yeah, I just generally studied fascism and um, certain broad political trends. Like I studied a lot about corporatism and uh, the role that that played into fascism. Uh, I don't know much about regime history, Italy. Obviously, there is no regime history, Great Britain. I only know the bare bones about Germany. Um, I tried reading Mein Kampf, didn't get very far in it. Um, I, I know a little bit about kind of Weimar history and a little bit about Nazi history. Basic bare bones stuff. Uh, but, you know, that's really as far as my knowledge goes. I read, I read a book by James Strachey Barnes, who was a, uh, an American fascist sympathizer in, in the 20s and 30s. But what you'll notice is I'm talking about all these books I've read, and it's all stuff that was written by fascists. And I, f I find that very important for getting uh, the true picture of who these people were. Uh, of course, you know, there's plentiful information about what these people did and how people reacted to them and what people's analysis of them is. And that's the kind of stuff that uh, I was already kind of more familiar with because it's just in the zeitgeist of the culture that I live in. But uh, I really wanted to understand fascism properly. So I I've, I've took special care in, in going straight to the source 
And I think that gave me a really good perspective on it. There are two main topics that I would like to talk about that um, really uh, help with understanding fascism and, and uh, will do the best job of explaining it. One of them I have to bring up uh, is the left-wing influence on fascism, which is something that is in a strange position of controversy because it's like... Um, so the conservatives will bring this up the most. Uh, conservatives like to bring up fascism's association with the left and its similarities to communism, uh, and they clearly have a biased agenda in doing that. And the left will always respond by really uh, distancing themselves as much as possible from fascism and saying that fascism is nothing but a purely far right wing ideology. And they are mostly true in that statement. Fascism is a far right ideology. And most of the things they say about it, I think, are generally correct. But I do think that uh, this position is a little bit reductive, especially when they get to talking about why people notice a connection between the left and fascism. And they talk about um, fascism using left-wing rhetoric and left-wing aesthetics to some degree uh, and techniques as basically a ploy or a manipulation tactic to prey on people who are somewhat bigoted but also uh, are needy and have needs that the state isn't addressing. And so then they fall in line with this uh, ideology that's really kind of there to subvert the best interests of the proletarians and create a reactionary counter-revolutionary effort through uh, sort of surface level ostensibly left-wing means. And that analysis has a lot of truth in it. I'm not here to say that this is a wrong analysis. What I am here to say, though, is that I think it's a little bit reductive and simplistic, and it does ignore some key facts. I think first it would be good to kind of set the stage as to what was going on in the world of conservatism in the West uh, during the early 20th century because conservatism hadn't really fully settled on the idea of free market capitalism until the Cold War and the fall of fascism. Before then, there was another voice in the air uh, in conservatism, which advocated for a more paternalistic state that took more measures to care for its citizens. I think one great example of this is uh, Father Charles Coughlin, who was an American priest, Catholic priest, who had a very popular radio show in the 1920s and 30s. He was also a fascist sympathizer and an anti-Semite. Uh, he was very against communism, but he was not against communism for its um, economic ramifications. What he was against was the atheism Ex expressed by these Marxist Leninists, by, by the USSR in particular. Um, he hated atheism, and when he criticized Jews, he normally criticized them for being atheistic and made a distinction between the bad atheistic Jews and the good religious Jews. And so what he basically wanted was a, a socialist state that was also Christian and conservative and traditional. And he was very popular at that time. He had a lot of people, especially because he was, he was uh, preaching during the Great Depression. And so he was a great mouthpiece for a, a big section of the American population. And he was very much appreciated by the American fascists and the American Nazis. And when his name was mentioned uh, at a very big Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden, it was met with tremendous applause. So American fascists really resonated with this strong 
sort of left wing. He was he was he criticized Franklin D. Roosevelt for not being radical enough with the New Deal. Uh, so Amer American fascists really resonated with this strong left wing populist kind of economics combined with this uh, traditional social conservatism. And I think, you know, so because when I talk about paternalistic conservatism, the roots of uh, conservatism uh, go back to its conflict with originally liberalism. Um, liberalism supported free market economics, low tariffs, and the rights of man, basically. And um, now, these days, the free market economic position is the conservative position. But back in the 1800s, they had a slightly more kind of old-fashioned mercantilist approach that supported tariffs, protectionism, and and even maybe monopolies, and also uh, clericalism uh, and the integration of church and state. And so there already was a kind of, of a tradition of conservatism uh, disagreeing with free market economics going back far in the past. And uh, as the Gilded Age progressed, uh, a lot of conservatives grew more paternalistic in their approach. And a lot of liberals grew more paternalistic in their approach, and thus we got social liberalism. Uh, there was also a thing called Christian socialism, which was a left-wing movement of Christians rather than atheists. So they rejected the kind of positivist doctrine of Marxism, but they were still socialists, and they they their socialism was really uh, motivated. Uh, by an appreciation for the teachings of Jesus, who, you know, if you read the Gospels, Jesus is pretty much uh, undoubtedly a communist. You know, the early Christians had to give up all their possessions, sell all of their holdings, and live communally with each other. And so these values were taken up by people with a rising social consciousness in the 19th century, both left and right. And, uh, you know, a, a big current of thought among the right during the late 19th and early 20th centuries was capitalism is out of control and it's turning people toward communism and thus toward atheism and everything we hate. We need to somehow reel in capitalism and we need to somehow uh, give workers a voice or at least give them what they need. Uh, in order to prevent our political culture from spiraling out of control into uh, unrestrained radicalism. And so from there, you end up kind of getting a syncretism of left and right beliefs emerging during this period. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, I think it's important to point out that a lot of the early fascist leaders were former leftists. Benito Mussolini was an avowed Marxist. He grew up in Marxism. His father was a Marxist and, in fact, was uh, one of the people responsible for electing the first Italian uh, socialist into parliament. Then there's Alfredo Rocco, a very important figure in fascism. He was uh, a former Marxist. Um, there were lots of people like... Uh, uh, Edmondo Rossoni, who were part of a group called National Syndicalists, uh, which I'll talk to uh, later. They were involved in fascism. Um, of course, in Germany, Hitler, uh, very early in his life, was uh, a supporter of the Social Democratic Party in Austria. And, um, of course, there were the Strasser brothers, who were... Uh, communists basically they were nazi communists and wanted nazi germany to uh, ally with the soviet union and to copy their economic model more or less in germany oswald mosley even uh he was in the labor party for a good chunk of time and called himself a socialist that was, of course, back when everyone in the Labour Party called themselves socialists. And his economics was very Keynesian and uh, really went beyond Keynesian, Keynesianism and wanted uh, a heavy sort of, uh, you could call it paternalistic 
government involvement in commerce. In fact, even when he was in the conservative party, he had this policy that he proposed called socialistic imperialism. So that was always in his language. And I think it's very clear that all of these former leftists brought with them a certain amount of that, that leftist strategy and ethos into their movement and that revolutionary mentality. Benito Mussolini even called uh, his coup a revolution rather than a counter-revolution, although it was in actual fact more of a counter-revolution in the end. And the economic model that fascism generally supported and promoted was called corporatism or corporativism, which is a type of syndicalism but it's a more um, kind of right-wing distortion of syndicalism. So syndicalism is basically trade unionism. There are various types of it, but generally the idea is that uh, syndicalists want trade unions to have a lot of power. They want uh, trade unions to own the means of production or have a say in government or even be the government. Anarcho-syndicalists want to uh, basically replace the state with a confederation of syndicates. So the idea of corporatism was that the trade unions are out of hand, they are um, subversive, they're revolutionary, and in order to curtail this, their method was to make the labor unions a legitimized part of the process and create a system of arbitration uh, where labor unions would get proper res representation. So that the unions would be called corporations and there would be a corporation for people of every profession. Uh, Mosley in his version of corporatism even, uh, you know, the, the, used uh, the example of uh, clerical uh, corporations or like housewife corporations for women. It's not just professions, it is uh, for people of different uh, social functions, basically. And these corporations would uh, represent them, they would be uh, elected uh, by the, the representatives or delegates would be elected by the members and then they would uh, represent them in arbitration uh, if they have a dispute with another corporation like a, a property owner's corporation or a uh, producer's corporation, a uh, landowner's corporation. If they had a dispute, then they would get arbitration from a neutral uh, party judge. And uh, I think you can see how this uh, sounds like a good idea, but it could also just be an avenue for more corruption because, um, I mean, who's going to assure the impartiality of the judge? And of course, when you, when you take the uh, labor unions and then fold them into the uh, government, then you kind of uh, strip away their autonomy. And so, uh, you know, there are, you can envision this as a very uh, good thing, or you can envision this as a basically a, uh, a counter-revolutionary measure. Uh, I think it was thought of in both ways, both inside and outside fascism, but it is nonetheless a, a more left-wing, more populist, uh, less free market approach to solving the problem of capitalism. It's a syncretic approach, really, and fascism is a syncretic ideology, and that's something that uh, people don't really talk about very much, I've noticed. Uh, you find it in books all the time, but uh, in on YouTube videos and whatnot, I, I don't really hear the word syncretic used very often to describe fascism, but I think that's very important. It's important to understand the left-wing influence, however strange and corrupted it became. And there were, of course, the national syndicalists who were a very important part of uh, the Italian development of fascism. And uh, for this, I'm a little bit fuzzy on this. Actually, this was uh, the, the topic, really, that I 
did research for this video in particular. Most of my research was done years ago. But I was, I noticed uh, this was something I wanted to talk about, but I didn't really know much about it. And uh, honestly, I'm still not very clear on it, even after looking through it, who the national syndicalists were and what was their precise relationship with fascism versus revolutionary syndicalism. Because there's a difference between revolutionary syndicalists and national syndicalists. Uh the revolutionary syndicalists were inspired by a writer named Georges Sorel, um, who himself had a kind of evolving political tra trajectory over his life, and I'm not entirely clear on what all of his ideas were. But revolutionary syndicalism was a decidedly left-wing phenomenon, whereas national syndicalism was more of a right-wing thing. And uh, from what I have seen, it seems that the national syndicalists were basically a fusion of the ideas of Georges Sorel and this other French writer named Charles Maurras, who uh, believed in a thing called integral nationalism, which was he was he was basically a staunch, hardcore monarchist, hated democracy, hated Jews hated atheism, and he uh, seems to have had some sympathies with the syndicalists of uh, Georges Sorel, um, and I don't know exactly why, but I think from what I can gather, the national syndicalists did have a relatively left-wing approach to uh, economics. They wanted a proletarian society and a proletarian economy and they wanted a uh, an economy that was run by proletarians rather than creating this elite uh, liberal uh, class of business owners that they didn't like uh, they would prefer the idea of having uh, sort of a, a decentralized uh management of business because this kind of dispersal of the profits would make it so that the most influential figures are the um, rightful aristocrats of, of the monarchy uh, followed by their sort of grassroots support at the bottom without this pesky kind of middleman corrupting everything uh, in the form of the bourgeoisie that I think is generally what they believed. Again, I'm, I'm not very clear on this. Maybe you can let me know in the comments if I got anything wrong. But it seems to me that the national syndicalists, even though they were decidedly right-wing movements, they had a somewhat left-wing approach to uh, their economic vision. And they uh, did intersect a lot with corporatism or corporativism and in fact uh, you could say that then many of the national syndicalists were actually corporatists rather than uh, syndicalists in the traditional sense and with Edmondo Rossoni who was a uh, national syndicalist and very high up ranking in the Italian regime um, he was the leader of the Confederation of uh, Corporations when it, Italy was kind of starting it up its uh, corporatist uh, agenda. Although, really, I don't think Italian corporatism really ever went anywhere uh, until like 1938, <laughs> which is like a ridiculously long time. But they did have a... Uh, a corporation system set up as early as the 1920s and it was actually disbanded in 28 because of Rossoni and because he was a little bit subversive he was obviously still a fascist and a supporter of the regime but he did push for actual workers rights uh eight hour work days better wages stuff like that basic union wants and desires 
He took his job as the representative of the Italian laborers seriously, and he wanted to give them the best deal. And this led to some disagreements between him and Mussolini that eventually led to him being declared an enemy of the state in 1943. So uh, it's clear that there was something going on. This wasn't just fascism trying to brand itself left wing as a ruse. There was clearly something deeper going on. There was more to it. It wasn't all uh, unilateral in thought. And in fact, economically, I think fascism was allowed to be somewhat eclectic due to its philosophy. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but then the the one other example I want to bring up is Alceste de Ambris, who was an earlier um, national syndicalist fascist who actually left the party in 1919 once he saw the direction it was going in. Once he saw Mussolini uh, start to rub shoulders more with the liberal elite, he determined that Mussolini was becoming a pawn of the liberal elite, and he left uh, the movement. But when he was there, uh, you can see in the fascist manifesto that he co-authored with the founder of futurism, Filippo Marinetti, uh, they, uh, they, they, they wrote this this. A doctrine that was, or rather a, a party platform, that really is almost indistinguishable from a typical democratic socialist party platform. I mean, they wanted proportional representation, voting rights for women, very pro-democracy, very anti-clerical, and progressive in their economic policy. The one thing that did separate them from... Uh, a democratic socialist party was that they were uh, fiercely pro-war. They were pro-World War I, and they wanted Italy to get a lot out of the peace settlement, including their irredentist goals in Dalmatia and Tarento. So that was really the schism that separated revolutionary syndicalism from national syndicalism. And widened the gap between those two. It was also the thing that broke Mussolini away from the Socialist Party because he was writing uh, as the editor of Avanti, the Italian Socialist Party newspaper, uh, for quite a while. And then uh, because he was pro-war, he couldn't uh, be a part of that anymore, and he had to make his own thing. And prior to the war... Um, National syndicalists and revolutionary syndicalists were able to work together to some extent, but once the war started, I think that really just drove them apart, and that made way for uh, national syndicalists to drift more to the right, embracing... I assume that this is around the time when they started really embracing the corporatist model as opposed to the syndicalist model. And... Uh, becoming more ingratiated with landowners and factory owners. And that's uh, really, that was aided, of course, by the fact that after the war, the Fasci di Combattimento uh, actually fought the socialist labor unions in the streets and created deals with their own nationalist labor unions that were more uh, amenable to the landowners. So that's uh, the the one thing is is the left wing associations of fascism. Um, the other big thing I want to talk about is this idea called the fascist minimum. Now this is a concept that I was introduced to in a, a book called Fascism by Roger Griffin, and uh, it's basically this idea that what what is the characteristic feature of fascism. What is the thing about fascism that has to exist in order for it to be fascism? It's the minimum requirement. And this is really something that has, that, that did elude me for quite a long time. And I spent a lot of my research just trying to figure out what this could be, because there had to be something. Fascism couldn't just be so nebulous 
as to not even be really definable. I wasn't willing to accept that idea. There had to be something that really characterized this ideology. Now, uh, Roger Griffin, uh, he proposed a fascist minimum of what he called palingenetic ultranationalism, which is the idea. Now, it's been years since I read this book, so I might be misrepresenting this, but I think it was the idea that uh, fascists believed that their race uh, had some mythic past where they were uh, in their glory days and that they wanted to revitalize the country and bring it back to that state of glory. And while this is definitely an important feature of fascism, to me, it just never really sat well with me that this was the fascist minimum, that this was the minimum requirement you had to have to be considered a fascist, and that uh, this was the defining feature of fascism. It seemed a bit oblique because um, while you can definitely find it in fascist rhetoric, not all fascist rhetoric really aligns with it, especially when you look at Mosley. Mosley hardly ever talked about that kind of crap. Mosley, you know, was mostly kind of more economically focused in his rhetoric, and I don't really see that uh, economic sort of drive for action as being all that tied to this palingenetic ultranationalism stuff. So I wasn't satisfied with that definition, and I continued looking. And uh, I have to say with confidence that eventually I did find the fascist minimum, at least uh, one that works for me, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, fascism, as I understand it, the key thing that distinguishes it is that it is an effort to combine the military and the civilian spheres of life. It is an effort to bring the values of the military and the practices of the military into the civilian world. When I, when I hit upon this, I was lying in bed. It was, it was like three months after I'd stopped reading about fascism. I was lying in bed thinking about it and suddenly it just hit me like a ton of bricks and suddenly I felt like I understood something that I'd been trying to understand so intensely for six months and not really getting anywhere because despite that the fact that this this feels so right it feels so central to me I don't really see this concept distilled uh in a lot of texts it's usually I think hard for people to get to the nut of it. They kind of, they dance around the edges, they show a bunch of stereotypes and traits that are associated with fascism. They can make a big long-winded article about it, or they can make a uh, brief but unsatisfactory um, little definition of it. But nothing really satisfies and nothing really makes me feel like I understand it. Um, but this does, this, this idea of the fascist minimum as the military integration into the civilian world makes a lot of sense. And I'll tell you why. Everything that I read about fascism connected to this central idea. And that is very important to me. It's important to me when defining an ideology to not uh, to, for it to have some coherence and some uh, uh, basic grain to it. And fascism has been criticized a lot over the years for being incoherent and not for, have, for not having consistency. And while I can definitely see this point, and I think it's a valid point in certain respects, I think it, it betrays a lack of proper grasp on the topic. So fascism came about because of World War I, and fascism is inseparable from World War I and its history. Um, fascism could not have existed the way it did if it weren't for World War I. Something that uh, is difficult to really <laughs> grasp now as a modern person is that before World War I, generally, 
war was seen as a good thing, at least by the people who bothered to write something down, a lot of them thought of war as a good thing, as not, not just like a necessary evil that we need to do in order to accomplish certain goals, but like a thing that's good for the human spirit, that uh, healthy competition between men, only this time the competition is lethal. And it was seen as a great way to bring glory and honor to your nation. And you know, honestly, I think in some ways people didn't fear death as much back in the old days. I think people have gotten really comfortable now, and they no longer have the drive to face death head on. And maybe that has something to do with atheism and uh, or just the irre irrelevance of religion in modern times as well. But before the war, there was uh, a great excitement for this war. Uh, people didn't necessarily know that it would be this long, drawn-out, horrible, bloody affair. They m might have thought it would be over by Christmas. But they did have a sense that this was a big deal. That this war was going to be a generation-defining moment. It was going to decide the fate of history. And a lot of people really wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to fight in this war. Mosley, uh, Oswald Mosley talks about in his autobiography how uh, when he enlisted, uh, he went to boot camp and they were worried, he and his friends were worried at boot camp that by the time they got to the field, the war would already be over. Uh, that's how much excitement and naivety there was in the air uh, before they actually got in the trenches. And generally, the enlisted men, uh, once they got in the air, became very anti-war very quickly. And people, really, after the war, there was a very cynical reflection on the topic of war in general. And that would only increase after World War II and the kind of the dream of war was starting to be dismantled but the people who held on to this dream for the longest were the young officer class uh and also women some women uh too because they didn't have to fight i guess but the young officer class of people they weren't the enlisted men they were a little bit higher ranking and they uh, they definitely, a lot of them remained pro-war well after the war was over. And these were the people who made up the bulk of a lot of the, the early fascists in, in the black shirt, uh, fasci. Also, a lot of them were the Arditi, which were the basically the Italian crack troops, the elite troops of the Italian army. These people brought a real masculine ethos to the group. But a lot, among uh, pro-war nationalists in Italy, there was a common goal of irredentism. They wanted to reclaim Dalmatia, which was once uh, part of the Republic of Venice. They had colonies along Dalmatia, and uh, back then it still had a pretty sizable Italian population, especially in the city of Fiume, but uh, it was mostly Slavic at that time. But the Italian irredentists still felt that it rightfully belonged to Italy, and they wanted that. Also, the city of Tarento, or Trent, which was uh, controlled by Austria at that time. And that was a motivation for Italian nationalists to want to join the Entente powers instead of the Central powers. And so Italian nationalists, like Mussolini, wanted to get into the war fighting against Austria and Germany. And part of their motivation for starting the fascist movements is that they were disappointed that they didn't get what they wanted out of the peace settlement in regards to this. And in fact, uh, one particular nationalist named Gabriele D'Annunzio, who was a poet, uh, he actually uh, took the city of Fiume in 1919, I believe. Um, he took the city of Fiume uh, uh, with a bunch of uh, Arditi and uh, war veterans and created his own mini little proto-fascist state uh, in there with a corporatist constitution, which, because he was a poet, uh, this constitution enshrined music as the nation's highest principle, uh, which is very interesting. 
Also, uh, this this charter of Carnaro, I believe it was called. Uh, also, this constitution was penned by Alteste de Ambris, who was also, like I said, the uh, uh, co-author of the original fascist manifesto of 1919. And really, it was Gabriele D'Annunzio who invented a lot of the fascist kind of aesthetic. He started doing the Roman salute, um, which actually, I believe the Roman salute shows up in a silent film that he actually wrote a, a little prologue for called Cabiria, and it's one of the most famous uh, silent films, certainly one of the most famous Italian silent films. But I don't, I don't think the Roman salute was really used by the Romans. It was uh, more of a, a, a modern uh, invention. But what the uh, fascists took from the war was striking because they were very impressed by the organization and the efficiency of the military. They were very impressed by how they could get things done and they had a unified purpose. Everybody worked together. Nobody asked too many probing questions. People obeyed authority. They had a rank system. It all functioned very smooth and lubricated. And there were a lot of scientific advancements in technology and medicine during the war. So this military ethos also spurred on uh, really good practical science that could help the nation as a whole and not just in the war effort. And, uh, well, you can see the contrast. They experience that life in the war and then they come home and try to engage in civilian politics and it's a nightmare. It's this bureaucratic, congested, a democratic system where everyone's bickering and squabbling. Nobody can work together. Everybody's petty. Nobody can get anything done. And meanwhile, they have these really urgent goals. They want Tarento. They want Dalmatia. They want Fiume. They want to give veterans land. They want to reap some reward from this fight that they had been struggling through for so many years. And the governments were stalling. This is all over Europe. People were upset about this stuff. The governments were just stalling and not getting things done because that's how democracies are, especially in a time as fraught as that. And so here we go from peak efficiency, dynamism, action, masculinity to this weak, effeminate party politicking garbage. It was such a disappointment. And they really felt that they needed to take matters into their own hands in order to get anything done. Another thing that they liked, that Mussolini in particular liked, uh, and you wrote about this in the newspaper, was the way uh, munitions factories were mobilized during the war. So factories were basically under martial law and they had to do what the military wanted them to do. Uh, this is goes both for the owners and the workers. And uh, it was all for the purpose of serving the nation in this great conflict. And Mussolini loved this. He loved this idea of taking the military approach to uh, getting things done and putting it on the production side of the economy uh, so that the state could really have a heavy hand in managing the affairs of the country. Oswald Mosley's big slogan as the leader of the British fascists was action and his symbol, the, uh, the circle with the flash in it, very similar actually to Marilyn Manson's Antichrist superstar symbol that he, he actually used as fascist imagery uh, on that album. Uh, but this symbol, the flash in the circle, was supposed to represent action through unity. The flash was action, dynamic electricity, and the circle represented unity. If everybody is united in a common goal and a common purpose, the world is yours. You can get anything done. And that is the core of the philosophy of fascism. And one of the people, the most important people to put this into writing was uh, Giovanni Gentile, who was considered the philosopher of fascism and basically Mussolini designated him as such because he liked his writing. 
And uh, Gentile talked about a thing called totalitarismo, totalitarianism. And this meant something a little bit different from how the term is used uh, colloquially. Colloquially, it just means a government that's very heavy-handed and authoritarian and controls all aspects of life. And that's kind of what it meant originally, according to Gentile as well, but with the added effect that um, the nation and the state are one and the same thing. There is no difference between the nation and the state. So if you love the nation, you have to love the state. If you're a supporter of the nation, you have to be a supporter of the state. Everything exists in the state, nothing outside the state, everything is for the state because the state is the nation. And this gets um, to really uh, the collectivism of fascism. Alfredo Rocco talked about the dichotomy of individualism and collectivism. And he said that it was really interesting. He talked about how liberalism and socialism are really that same ideology just logically progressed but it is a very intrinsically individualist ideology we think of generally socialism as a collectivist ideology but it's only collectivist um, in its praxis and its practical economic strategy um, and its uh, use of numbers uh, as a strategy against uh, a smaller group of elites, strength in numbers. Now that is a collectivist approach, but it is a collectivist approach in service of an individualist goal. The goal is to liberate uh, the individual from tyranny, to, the, to liberate the individual from the shackles of labor, and to allow him to express himself as an individual in the full flower of his individual glory. Um, and thus they had a very positivist, very scientific, very materialist uh, notion of uh, ontology and uh, historical development. It was about facts over feelings, basically. Fe you know, reels over feels. But uh, people like Gentile, Gentile was part of the Italian idealist tradition. And Gentile was like, no, it's feels over reels. Feeling thought mind is more real than matter think about that mind is more real than matter i believe this is a sentiment that actually goes back to plato who talked about ideal forms and such uh plato was an idealist but this is a concept an ontological concept that i just don't understand i'll i'll i'll, I'll admit it i i I honestly don't really get what they're talking about. I just don't know how something that is so abstract and nebulous can be more real than something so concrete. It just doesn't make sense to me. But this was the kernel of Gentile's philosophy, and this informed how he talked about fascism. In fascism, everybody exists in order to serve the nation. It is a supremely collectivist ideology. It's maybe not uh, the most collectivist you could possibly go. They still recognize the importance of the individual and the individual's specific talents, but uh, they didn't recognize the importance of any kind of subversive. They didn't recognize the importance of the, the, the uh, idol smashers, the people who tear down and pluck up or question things or are creative uh, intellectually that was not what they were about what they were about was how people could bring their unique focus and their unique abilities into one common goal it was about unifying the nation making everybody live harmoniously as just a perfect lubricated machine and you can see how this appealed to Marinetti, the futurist, because uh, Italian futurism was this uh, strange little art and philosophy movement about uh, embracing technology over nature. 
and embracing a real strong masculine dynamic approach to life. Um, masculine values, that's a military thing. Everything about fascism can be traced back to the military. We have xenophobia. We have wanting everybody to be the same. Uh, we have nationalism, patriotism, militarism, irredentism, masculinity, traditional values, preference for excellence over weakness. And of course, the aesthetics. Fascism is often called the politics of aesthetics, and that is very true. Aesthetics are extremely important for the military, and aesthetics are very important for fascism with all of the military parades and the flags and the symbols and the salutes, and also morale. Morale is very important in battle, and uh, generals will give these inspiring, rousing speeches to get people to go out there and fight their hardest. The same tactic was used by the fascists in a civilian arena. They would create these big rallies where they would uh, excite people and get them waving their hats and screaming, and they would inspire people to go out there and serve their country in whatever way they could. And people loved it. People loved feeling like they were a part of something bigger than themselves, much bigger than themselves. You know, Alfredo Rocco considered uh, liberalism and uh, communism to be anti-historical movements, anti-historical ideologies, because they only recognized the here and now. They only recognized the current conditions and the current generation of the nation. What is good for the current generation isn't what's best for the nation as a whole, thought Rocco. And this was very important. The nation of the whole, as a whole was not just the current generation. It was every generation in the past as well. And so if you wanted to serve your country, you not only had to serve your people, you had to serve the people who came before you. And what exactly that means, I'm not quite so sure, but it definitely involves an appreciation and a, a, a de desire to preserve tradition. Fascists are not utilitarians. You know, there's that great um, Friedrich Nietzsche quote, uh, the human being doesn't desire happiness. Only the Englishman wants that, which is a reference to uh, English utilitarianism, this idea that the greatest amount of happiness uh, is the goal in uh, civic planning. You should create a system that make, creates the most amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people. This is a very secular, a very rational way uh, to look at uh, what the aim of society should be. This was a view that was rejected by fascism. Now, the fascists still, as we covered, they still uh, cared for your average person. They weren't, you know, uh, might makes right ideology because they believed in strength in numbers and working together. They wanted to uplift everybody from the bottom up. So there was definitely something of a humanitarian strain in fascism, at least as it applies to the in-group, to the nationals. And that made people feel like they were cared for. When their politicians got up on stage and gave them rousing speeches about all the great things that they were going to do for them, that made them feel like they had a government that was really looking out for their best interests if they happened to agree with and believe the fascist program. But as for what the goal of the state and the nation should be, it was not, you know, happiness was not considered the goal. The goal was honor and glory. And that was something that required sacrifice from people. That was something that required sometimes bloodshed. And I think it's a more robust kind of value than simple happiness. And what I mean by that is if somebody really believes that they have a duty, 
that transcends their own personal happiness. That can motivate you to do so much more than simply looking for personal satisfaction. And it can give you a sense of personal satisfaction that runs so much deeper as a result. If you really feel like you are fulfilling a purpose, that creates a kind of peace of mind that is hard to replicate in such a you know, cynical, nihilistic, secular disposition as the one I have. And so in that way, I think there's a good argument to be made that the, um, the adoption of fascism wasn't a completely uh, irrational sickness of the culture, that there was something deeper that was being expressed in it. Because the way I see fascism talked about, specifically in regards to the appeal of fascism, I see it talked about generally in, in a very cynical way as um, it's just like a sickness of a community that's inflicted by material conditions, by poverty, that is looking for a scapegoat, something to blame, and they take it out in the wrong place, and they're angry, and bleh, bleh, it's all bad. I don't know if it actually was that way. When you see people at these rallies and these parades and these celebrations, there's just so much joy, excitement, vibrance, exuberance in them. There was a real love going on. There was a positivity in the air uh, underneath all of the hate and above all of the hate. And that's something that kind of goes unacknowledged by critics of fascism, but I think it's really important to point out what fascism did for people personally could have been a good thing if you are utilitarian and you believe that happiness uh, is the goal. I think that um, in some ways this did make people happy. In other ways, it didn't. And in other ways, it was really, really bad. It was particularly for the people who were part of the out-group, out but they were still um, able to be bullied. The Nazis in particular were very uh, nasty in this regard, and they had a particular hatred for Jews more than anyone else. And that caused some really, really, really horrific things uh, in the Holocaust and the, the lead up to the Holocaust. So there's definitely horrible consequences to this. But, but what is the this? The this is the rejection of positivism. They were not positivists. They were idealists. They believed that ideas, that mind was more real than matter. And therefore, that their beliefs were more real than science, more real than anything observable. And that science was really in a secondary uh, position to the, the national agenda. The fascists loved science, but they wanted science to serve their purposes rather than them serving science's purposes, which is how more, um, more secular people like me think of it. Speaking of secular, Mussolini himself was an atheist. I believe that he was probably a lifelong atheist. He wrote about it in 1904 in an article and really laid into all the reasons why he was anti-clerical and anti-religious and God is a superstition and all that. Uh, but then he still supported the Catholic Church. Why is that? It's because he recognized that the nation and the unity of the nation and the character and traditions of the nation were more important than the observable truth. What the nation wanted was more real than what was observable. That is something very important to understand because this allows the fascist to reject science. 
to reject anything that doesn't go along with their program. And I think this is generally interpreted among critics of fascism as pure cynicism, but I personally see it more as just a difference of values. They simply don't value the scientific approach and the rational approach as much as they value that feeling of commonality and unity and efficacy. It's hard to wrap your mind around if you are not from this kind of background, but I, I think that this is very important. And these, these sorts of thoughts and beliefs, these are not like things that every fascist believed. These are the things that when, when fascists reflected on their beliefs, these are the conclusions they came to. But fascism was more of a feeling than a thought. Normal people weren't supposed to do this deconstructive analysis and they weren't expected to and they didn't largely. That, that's not what this was about. For normal people, it was just they were going with where their heart was taking them. And that was the strength of fascism. And that was really part of what allowed fascism to be so uh, eclectic at first and so um, sort of wishy-washy about the details. The details really didn't matter. The strategy didn't matter. You know, specific economic prescriptions didn't matter to fascism. Their approach was very pragmatic in the sense that they would go with whatever they felt worked the best for the goal that they had. And so I guess, uh, you know, aside from the, the just the, the consequences of the, the, the bloodshed and the Holocaust of it all, the main thing that the main problem or the main um, difference that I have with fascism is this rejection of positivism, this rejection of materialism. Now, I, I don't, I, I'm not totally against uh, criticizing materialism. I think that materialism is a limited worldview, but um, the rejection of it and all that comes with it and secularism and all that, uh, I don't particularly like. And I don't like the way fascism subverts uh, thought and creativity uh, in order to serve a what they consider a higher a higher purpose because i think that uh i i just personally like um intellectuality and i like creativity and i think it brings color to life in a way that um simple patriotic fervor doesn't really uh replace it doesn't really um replicate uh whatever we're losing. Now, I will agree that if we don't have any patriotic fervor, if we don't have any feeling of unity uh, and uh, common purpose and um, faith, we do lose something there too. So it's not a total, it's not like I'm saying my way of looking at it is uh, completely good and completely positive as opposed to fascism. But I do think that, you know, I recommend caution and I recommend uh, deconstruction and analysis and thought. And um, I recommend um, not taking things seriously, not having reverence and um, not, uh, not getting worked up over things, keeping a calm mind. All of these are anathema to the fascist ethos. Um, but to me, they feel like really important things. They're very, very important in um, creating, creating a more harmonious world, I think. And I think fascists only see the destructive nature of it. They see uh, they're tearing down everything that matters. But no, it doesn't have to be about tearing down everything that matters. It could be about 
finding what really matters. And in looking for what really matters, I suppose I've discovered something in fascism that goes unsaid. I've discovered that the unique value set of fascism does uh, have some kind of validity to it if you look at it from a different perspective. There are other ways to look at morality besides just, um, you know, do good unto other people and other people will do good unto you because the world isn't as simple as that and there are a lot more complicated um, sides of morality and fascism has a way of uh, simplifying morality so that it is sort of like um, a very individualist and darwinist ideology on the macro scale so instead of each uh, person being his own organism looking for his own success it is an entire super organism that is doing the exact same thing competing on an individual level level with other super organisms and so morality is collectivized you know not just the aims and the goals and the materials are collectivized but morality itself becomes about the nation as an individual and perhaps if we could all abandon our natural human instinct to discover the truth and um, relate to each other in an honest way if we could abandon somehow that very essential part of the human spirit completely, then maybe we could really get something out of being subsumed into some sort of collective. You know, this gets to that sort of um, debate about the Borg. There was a great Rick and Morty episode where um, Rick was dating this hive mind collective and um, Summer and Morty uh, try to get, well, Summer rather, tries to get all the people to wake up out of the hive mind but when she does that then they all start a race war against each other and then they all uh, they suddenly society falls to pieces but when everybody was under the hive mind everybody got along everyone was harmonious and perhaps if we are individuals perhaps we would be happier and more successful if we lived in such a collectivized manner, if we thought collectively instead of individually. And this is something that's really worth considering. You know, you don't have to agree with it ultimately. And I, I suppose you know by now that I don't agree with it. Um, Cause I, I just, my values just simply do not align with that. And um, the, the, I suppose that's, the danger of fascism that it prescribes values to people who aren't willing to uh, accept them and that leads to a lot of conflict and that is an issue that fascism can't really address it's not really built to address the people who just don't agree if you can get with the program then maybe fascism seems really good to you but if you're just too damn honest <sighs> What am I going to do? Pr pretend to be stupid? I guess I just have too much of an ego for fascism, which is ironic considering that Mussolini is one of the most famously egotistical people in history. You know, fascism sought to resolve class tensions by doing away with class consciousness, by doing away with the idea of class altogether and creating a... Uh, a more equitable society where everybody got what they worked for. But even though society, even though fascism had a plan for class conflict, it didn't have a pro, it didn't have a program for ideological conflict other than simply intolerance, censorship. Now, uh, I'm not I'm not saying that fascism was entirely heavy-handed with its censorship, 
uh italy certainly had a greater amount of freedom in the press of course they didn't have a free press they had a greater amount of freedom in in publishing uh than uh germany for instance but definitely it went against the totalitarian uh ethos to try to subvert subvert the goals of the state so there you have it. That's my introduction to fascism from a nihilist perspective. I hope you got something out of it. And this is by no means the last video about fascism I'm going to make. I'm going to be making several other videos um, about uh, the fascist regime in Italy, all the players who were involved in starting up the movement. And of course, I want to make a video all about the life of Oswald Mosley, a character who I find very interesting. Um, so I look forward to those in the next few years. They're not coming immediately. I still have a couple other big projects to do before I start work on that. Uh, but I thought I'd get this one out as a preliminary uh, just to introduce the subject and um, see if people are interested in it. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you whenever my next upload comes.